Coleman, and on behalf of the African American Military History Museum, I would like to welcome you all to our program this afternoon, which is um, being uh, this panel discussion here is from the USM Department of History. And here we have the book talk for integrating the U.S. military, race, gender, and sexual orientation since World War II. I'm going to introduce to you our uh, members of the panel this afternoon. Um, first, we have Mr. Eddie T. Dockery. Um, he's a president, CEO, retired, certified service-connected disabled veteran, senior contract specialist, and professional en engineer electronics. Mr. Dockery has more than 30 years of experience in the management and federal government and private sector contracts as a corporate CEO and federal employee in conjunction with the military experience as an Army warrant officer with a responsibility of millions of dollars in government supplies and equipment. Mr. Dockery believes that his military service has provided him the knowledge and discipline to succeed in the public and private sectors. He served as an Airborne Ranger Special Forces Special Operations Combat Communications Officer with several tours of combat duty in the Republic of Vietnam where some of the military awards and commendations he received were as follows, Federal Government Veteran Contractor of the Year 2000, Republic of Vietnam Medal of Honor, Civil Star for Valor, Purple Heart for Wounds Received in Combat, Vietnam Service Commendation, Presidential Unit Commendation, numerous commendations for attention to duty and valor, Rotary Wing Pilot, in addition to operating and managing his own companies for a period of more than 10 years, Mr. Dockery has exceptional knowledge of installation, management, and secure voice and secure data installation and maintenance as it relates to contracts and acquisition of naval systems. <coughs> Our next panelist is Hattiesburg native Charles J. Brown, is a graduate of L. J. Rowan School, class of 1958. He went to serve as a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. While the Viet in Vietnam, Brown saw action near Dak Tu, is that correct? Dak Tu. Dak Tu. On one occasion, Brown and his men aided two U.S. companies who had become surrounded by North Vietnamese forces. The trapped companies had already experienced more than 100 casualties when Brown endangered himself to rescue wounded soldiers. Thanks in part to Mr. Brown's leadership, to the men were able to fight their way out of the situation. By the time Brown left Vietnam, his bravery had earned him two bronze stars, two purple hearts, and a combat infantry badge medal. In 1994, he was honored as Hattiesburg's very first Viet veteran of the year. Mr. Brown was also partnered with the History Department of USM on numerous occasions to teach students about the experiences of Vietnam veterans. He was featured in the History Channel's documentary, Vietnam in HD. In 2015, Mr. Brown was awarded the prestigious Hub Award in recognition of his service to the community. Mr. Brown currently serves as a membership chairman of the African American Military History Museum Committee, and he is a commissioner for the Hattiesburg Convention Commission. <laughs> Our next panelist is Heather Marie Stirr, PhD. Her uh, bio is as follows. She is an associate professor at the, of history at the University of Southern Mississippi and a fellow in USM's Dale Center for the Study of War and Society. Her first book, Beyond Combat, Women and Gender in the Vietnam War Era, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. She is also the co-editor of Anthology Integrating the U.S. Military Race, Gender, and Sexuality Since World War II, which has just been released by Johns Hopkins University Press. She is currently writing two books, Saigon at War, South Vietnam, and the Global Sixties, for Coney Cambridge University Press, and reflecting America-U.S. Military Expansion and Global Interventions forthcoming from Prager ABC. 
In 2013-14, Dr. Sturr was a Fulbright Scholar in Vietnam where she was visiting a visiting professor in Faculty and International Relations at the University excuse me, of Social Sciences and Humanities in Ho Chi Minh City. And last but not least, Dr. Uh, Douglas Bristol is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Southern Mississippi. In 2002, he received his PhD with distinction from the University of Maryland, where he studied under Ira Berlin, correct? He is a scholar of the African American experiences and race relations. He has been awarded postdoctoral fellowships from the Smithsonian, Duke University and Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. He is one of the two faculty members at the University of Southern Mississippi nominated for the National Endowment for Humanities Summer Stipend in 2013. His first book, Knights of Razor, Black Barbers in Slavery and Freedom, was reissued in paperback in 2015 by the Johns Hopkins University Press. In it, Bristol examines the relationship between black barbers and the perspective uh, prosperous white men whose throats they shave with straight-edged razors from the colonial period of the Great Migration. He is a co-editor of the Integrating the U.S. Military Race, Gender, and Sexuality book, which it will be published by the John Hopkins University Press in May 2017. He is currently working on his next book, The Black Greatest Generation, African American Men and Women in Uniform During World War II. Dr. Bristol. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna just give the, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my chapter, and then Heather, and then of course we're gonna leave it open to our two panelists. I'm honored to speak here at the African American Military History Museum. It's, it's the perfect place uh, for us to launch integrating the U.S. military. I want to start by thanking Ms. Latoya and Norman for inviting us to come and have this event. And of course, I also want to thank uh, my panelists, uh, Mr. Eddie Dockery and Mr. Charles Brown, for sharing their, their perspective on the issues we raised today. I want to begin my remarks by talking about a report that the Equal Justice Initiative released last year on Veterans Day. The report was called Lynching in America, Targeting Black Veterans. And it says that between 1877 and 1950, quote, no one was more at risk of experiencing violence and targeted racial terror than black veterans. Let me read that again just for emphasis. No one was more at risk of experiencing violence and targeted racial terror than black veterans. Now, Brian Stevenson is the founder and director of the Equal Justice Initiative, said in an interview that this report should change the way that we remember black veterans. Here's a quote from him. We do so much in this country to celebrate and honor folks who risk their lives on the battlefield, but we don't remember that black veterans were more likely to be attacked for their service than honored for it. So, how does this book speak to the issues raised by this report? Um, as sobering as Stevenson's comments are, he left out something, which is that black soldiers were targeted while they were in the military. And our book, Integrating the U.S. Military, provides a historical perspective for understanding why black soldiers have been targeted. The answer ultimately has to do with the fact that the US military is a product of American society and its tradition of racism. At the same time, I want to point out something that Stevenson overlooked in his report. Black soldiers fought back. And their resistance to racism helped overcome racism in the military. And I want to argue that we need to honor them not only for their service in defense of their country, but also for their role in making the U.S. military the most colorblind institution in America today. Now, I only have time to tell you one story from there's three chapters in the book that speak to the African American experience. So I'm going to tell you uh, a story from each of those chapters, from my own chapter. I'm going to tell a story about something that happened right here in Hattiesburg during World War II. 
Um, then I'm going to share a story from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, uh, the height of the Vietnam War, 1969. And the third story is, comes from the Defense Race Relations Institute at Patrick Air Force Base in the early 1970s. And I chose these stories because they answer the questions that have organized my talk around. First, why were black soldiers targeted? Second, how did black resistance to racism help change the military for the better? And third, finally, why do we need to honor black soldiers for helping reform the U.S. military? All right, so let's go to that first question. Why were black soldiers attacked? Before I tell you the story of Sergeant Joseph Haley, I want to say a little bit more about the Equal Justice Initiative's report of black veterans that I mentioned. This report supplements a groundbreaking report they issued in 2015, Lynching in America, which documented 4,075 lynchings. That's 800 more than any other count that had been documented before. In case you were wondering, uh, there were nine African Americans lynched right here in Forest County between 1877 and 1950. The Equal Justice Institute's report of black veterans said that, quote, between the end of Reconstruction and the years following World War II, thousands of black veterans were accosted, assaulted, and attacked, and many were lynched. African American men were attacked because when they put on the uniform of their country, they challenged the myth of racial inferiority that justified the racial hierarchy. Many white people feared that black veterans have been empowered by their military service, would come home and be unwilling to work for poor wages on farms. And they were right. Southern politicians expressed fears that black veterans would lead other African Americans to challenge racial segregation and subordination. And they were right. Many veterans, so the symbolism of the uniform is a direct threat to the system of white supremacy that supported the South through the 60s. Many veterans were attacked for nothing more than wearing their uniform, which helps explain what happened to Sergeant Joseph Haley in Hattiesburg during World War II. So this is a story of a ride on a public bus. It was quarter to eight in the evening on Christmas Eve, 1945, Sergeant Haley boarded a public bus in Hattiesburg. Because the buses were segregated, although there were no white passengers on board, he went to the back of the bus. Um, as he got back there, the section, the seats had a card that would indicate the division between the white and the black section. There weren't enough seats left in the black section, so another soldier moved the card one seat forward, and they both sat down. This caught the attention of the white bus driver, H.F. Williams, who yelled out, leave that car alone. Then he left them in peace. At Johnson's Crossing, which is about a mile outside the city limits of the city of Hattiesburg, several white passengers boarded the bus. Williams, for whatever reason, took that opportunity to tell the black soldier who had moved the car to straighten it out. The black soldier refused. Sergeant Haley, hoping to defuse the situation, complied with the bus driver's request. That was a mistake. Instead of placating the white bus driver, he focused his attention on him. He called Sergeant Haley, son of a bitch, and shot him in the abdomen. Afterwards, white as well as black witnesses told military investigators that Sergeant Haley had done nothing to provoke this controversy. Williams had shot Sergeant Haley for no other reason that he was a black man in a uniform on his bus. For his part, Williams had few worries about being prosecuted. He had shot another black soldier on March 19, 1944, and he had been released on bond. The military report, which is you know, where this information comes from, on the shooting incident, held out no hopes that Williams would be prosecuted. So it would appear that Hattiesburg's white leaders condoned the targeting of black soldiers to keep them in the place. Now, my chapter has several uh, instances of black resistance to racism, but in order to discuss James Westheider's chapter on Vietnam, I'm going to go to a story there set in Camp Lejeune. This concerns a race riot at a service club. It was the evening of July 20th, 1969, and the 1st Battalion, the 6th <coughs> Marine, was having a big party, going away party. 
The next day, they were going to ship out uh, to join the 6th Fleet in Rota, Spain. Because the military was integrated in Vietnam, the party was integrated. There were roughly 100 African-American and Hispanic soldiers present, as well as 75 white uh, soldiers. Over the course of the evening, several minor scuffles had taken place between the black and white Marines. When a black Marine attempted to cut in on a white soldier who was dancing with a black wave, so this was a black woman serving in the Navy, a fight broke out. The order was restored, and this kind of took the edge off the party. So many men started leaving to go back to their barracks. However, at about 11 o'clock, a very bloody white Marine stumbled into the service club and said he had just been beaten by several black Marines. Over the next half hour, another 15 injured white Marines came into the building from an interracial brawl that had started out front of the building. Outside, 30 black and Hispanic Marines yelled, White Beast! And we're going to mess up some beasts tonight! As they fought similar groups of white Marines. By the time was, fighting was over, dozens of men were injured. Now the controversy that arose from this riot led to reform. The problems with race relations at Camp Lejeune made the national news. For instance, the Pittsburgh Courier published an article about this, <coughs> and under the headline, Lejeune described as worse than Mississippi. The black newspaper reported that a common request found in the suggested box at Camp Lejeune was, quote, Coons, please go back to Africa. The House Armed Services Committee investigated the racial situation at Camp Lejeune and found that racial discontent exploded following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King because many white soldiers openly celebrated his death. The committee found also that the problems in race relations extended far beyond Camp Lejeune. In Vietnam, Germany, the United States, and Canada, white military personnel were found to have donned Klan robes. On several bases, commanders allowed Klan caverns to operate openly. The results of this and other federal investigations was the creation of the Defense Race Relations Institute at Patrick Air Force Base in 1971, which is the chapter of the subject of Isaac Hampton's chapter. And when we look at that story, we're going to understand the answer to the question, why black soldiers should be honored for helping reform the military. Um, discrimination, oddly enough, led Sergeant Eugene Johnson to volunteer to help reform the military. Ironically, Sergeant Johnson had been posted to Patrick Air Force Base in 1963, so that's eight years before the race relations school was open. Although Johnson was the ranking staff sergeant, his white superiors did not want him to command troops. So when he reported to duty, they sent him out to work at the weather station. He was discouraged, but he didn't give up on the military. In fact, he later uh, was posted to Washington, D.C., where he worked for the Defense Atomic Support Agency. Yet when the Defense Race Relations Institute was opened at Patrick Air Force Base in 1971, he volunteered to go back and work at the Race Relations School. Even at this school, Sergeant Johnson was confronted by white racists. The School on Race Relations was created in response to controversies like the one we saw at Camp Lejeune, and did not have widespread support in the military. Sergeant Johnson said, quote, most people thought the school would not last. He also said there were spies, quote, who would come down to watch us and they would report back we were brainwashing the students. Some opponents tried to close the school with violence. Johnson recalled, we had people that threatened our lives. I was threatened so I bought a 38 special that I kept in my car when I drove to work. Even in my office, I would have bricks and stone, stones thrown through the office windows. By not quitting in response to these threats, Sergeant Johnson resisted attempts to end reform in the military. His courage shows that black soldiers were not only disproportionately targeted by racists, but they also played an outsized role in ending racial discrimination. So as you've heard, Black soldiers were targeted for abuse and violence within the military as well as when they returned to civilian life. 
Story of Sergeant Joseph Haley illustrates that wearing a uniform in Hattiesburg could make a black man a target during World War II. The story of Camp Lejeune Wire illustrated that desegregation had not ended racial hostility towards black soldiers during Vietnam, but it also illustrates that the resistance of black soldiers is what led to military reform. <coughs> Finally, the story of Sergeant Eugene Rock Johnson illustrated that military reform succeeded in large part because soldiers like Johnson simply refused to give up on the military as an institution. So what conclusion can we draw from this? If the targeting of black soldiers and veterans became central to our understanding of the black military experience, it would transform the history of the U.S. military and of American race relations. This recentering disproves assertions by military leaders that race relations was a civilian affair outside of their jurisdiction. Right? We've heard that military officials failed to seek the prosecution of H.F. Williams after he shot two soldiers on public buses. We've heard that military officials allowed the KKK to operate openly on military bases. Yet to understand why military leaders tolerated racial violence and intimidation, we have to look outside uh, the military to the broader American society that maintains segregation and targeted black men to this day. Black soldiers lend new clarity to the investigation of American race relations because when they donned their uniform of their nation and fought to defend it, they challenged stereotypes about African Americans, particularly World War II, in ways that domestics and sharecroppers could not. That's why they were targeted so frequently. At the same time, paying attention to the impact of black soldiers when they resisted discrimination highlights the contributions that black soldiers made to overcoming racism which are as important to remember as their contributions to the defense of the United States. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Latoya Norman, uh, Shantasia Coleman, and Douglas Bristol for organizing this event. I really, really appreciate being a part of it, and also to say thank you to Mr. Charles Brown and Mr. Eddie Dockery for joining us to share their experiences. Um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief so that we uh, give our veterans enough time to kind of give the, the human face, uh, some more of the human face behind some of the issues that Dr. Bristol and I deal with and our colleagues deal with in our book. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, military integration regarding gender and sexuality because I think uh, these two issues are very relevant provide some context that's very relevant for uh, some issues that are going on right now that have been going on for a while. Um, in terms of policy, things like the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2011, and then the opening of combat specialties to women in December, beginning of December um, of 2015. In addition to policies, we also have issues such as uh, repeated reports of sexual assault in the military and increased awareness by the Defense Department of some of these issues, increased studies into the issue of sexual assault and rape in the military, and then also issues like Marines United. Uh, so the, the issue where a, some male Marines posted photographs of nude and partially nude female Marines on Facebook without the women's consent. When we take these two uh, issues together, the policy making changes that have occurred and then kind of the cultural responses um, to some of these policy making changes, we can see two overarching themes. We can see that integration of the military has shown the military to be, in a way, pragmatically progressive. And we can think about the military as being pragmatically progressive, and Douglas pointed out some of these, um, the ways in which this played out in terms of race. But to meet personnel needs, the military, military authorities have sometimes crafted policies that were progressive, especially relative to the civilian world and what opportunities were available for certain minority groups in the civilian world. At the same time, cultural resistance to military integration has been much more difficult to change. Um, it's been difficult, you can't really legislate a mindset change. It's difficult to legislate or, or to force even the change in an image in our collective head of what an American soldier is, or who an American soldier is, um, uh, who represents and wields U.S. power in the world. Can it be a woman? Can it be a gay man? 
can it be an African American man or woman? Um, the, the image of who is an American soldier has proven to be much more difficult to change than the policy of actually opening uh, uh, military positions up to various minority groups. And so there's a tension between military integration at the policy level and resistance to policies that appear to challenge the traditional image of the U.S. military. And so a question that I've begun to think about, that I've kind of begun to ask, is this. Where does the traditional image of the U.S. military come from? Did the military create this image? Or is it a product of broader civilian attitudes about race, gender, sexuality, American identity, and American power? I don't have the answer. Um, I, I want to put that out there because it's something I've been thinking about, and maybe in the discussion, I would actually be curious to know um, what you all think about that. But where does this image come from? Is it the military that's created the, what we think of when we think of American, the projection of American power in the world through the military? Or is this something that reflects more broadly on the civilian world? Um, so that's the question that I pose to you that we can uh, maybe discuss during the conversation. Now I just want to give a few brief points about the integration of women into the military since World War II, since that's the scope of um, Doug's and my uh, edited collection. The history of U.S. women and the military has basically been one of gradual integration and fairly consistent cultural resistance. So going back to World War II, during World War II, manpower needs led the Army to establish the Women's Army Corps in 1943, which opened clerical, intelligence, communications, and other non-combat specialties to women. The idea being that we can free up more men to fight if women can fill those, um, those kind of desk positions. Civilians who criticized the creation of the Women's Army Corps argued that this type of mobilization of women was going to A, either put women in harm's way, or B, provide a space for women who were either so-called loose women or who were lesbians. There was a fear among civilian critics that the creation of the Women's Army Corps was going to make it easier for lesbian women to meet other lesbian women or for, again, so-called loose women to find men who would provide them with what, what they apparently needed. But that was the critique. So it's either this kind of the, 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 the lesbian or whore dichotomy of women. And we'll see that again. I'll, I'll bring up another moment in which that pretty much same language was used to talk about women in the military, American women in the military. Um, in fact, in the Vietnam War, uh, women who I've interviewed who served as in the Women's Army Corps, who served as uh, military nurses, talked about how they were judged by their um, male comrades, and it, it, in their stories, it tended to be officers um, who would accuse them of joining the military and coming to Vietnam to get a man, to be a tease to, to men who were there, to be prostitutes who were willing to sell themselves to their male comrades. So we see that theme continuing into the Vietnam era. And then, when the Defense Department abolished the draft uh, at the end of the Vietnam War, and the armed forces began reaching out to recruit more women to fill the ranks of an all-volunteer force, we see that same mentality come up again. Um, so the, the U.S. service academies began admitting women in 1976. The Army dissolved the Women's Army Corps in 1978 and began um, integrating service women into the regular Army. Um, there was an article that covered this uh, integration. There was a magazine called Family, the magazine of Army, Navy, Air Force Times. Um, and it published an article called, You've Come a Long Way, Maybe. So you might remember the Virginia Slims, You've Come a Long Way, Baby, ad. This is a play on that. So you've come a long way, maybe. And it refers to this tension between the legal opening of positions to women in the military, but the continued cultural resistance. So in this article, there were um, male military officers and enlisted men who were interviewed, and they talked about service women, and they used phrases like, well, if a woman wants to be in the Army, she must be a hopeless nymphomaniac. That's a quote from this article. Or, a hopeless lesbian. So the same words that are used in response to the Women's Army Corps created, being created in World War II, still being used in the late 1970s, so 30-some years later, to um, respond to the opening or to the integration of women into the military. Despite the resistance, in 1980, the first integrated class of West Point uh, graduated, 62 women cadets graduated out of 
Um, 119 entered, so about half the class uh, went on to graduate. About 119 women entered in that class, the class of 76, graduated in 1980. Um, in the early 1990s, more than 40,000 American women served in the Gulf War, and Congress authorized service women to fly combat missions and to serve on combat ships. And about 300,000 American women have served in the 21st century wars, U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, two women in the last year or so graduated from the Army's Elite Ranger School. But we still have resistance to the idea of women serving in combat. So we can see these steps towards, like I said, gradual integration. And now the question is combat. And lots of questions about should women serve in combat? Does women's service in combat harm unit cohesion? Does it harm morale? Does it unnecessarily put women who can't actually handle the combat moment in harm's way? Lots of different conversations um, that are still being held, even though legally the combat specialties are open to women according, uh, as, as directed by the Defense Department. There's still resistance. At the heart of some critics' resistance is concerns about the draft. So if the U.S. were to reinstate the draft, would women then be subject to it because they can now serve in combat? Because the draft is really mean, meant to serve to, to refill um, infantry positions vacated by killed or wounded soldiers. So should women then be subject to the draft if they can serve in, in combat positions? And that is something that, that I have seen and read, um, especially legislators who oppose the opening of combat specialties to women talk about. Well, I don't think women should be drafted. And they talk about it in very emotional, sentimental terms. I couldn't imagine my daughter being drafted. But they don't talk about their sons in that way. So we see something like this. If sons and brothers are drafted and subsequently killed in a war, it is a tragic but necessary fulfillment of duty to the nation. If the same happens to daughters and sisters, it is a cause for national outrage against the gender equality movement for upend upending the natural order of things. So this is a very emotional argument of, I just couldn't imagine having to send my daughter off to war, which is not a conversation that we really have about our sons. And it speaks back to some of that same kind of cultural mentality about who serves the military and in what way should they serve. Um, so to, I'll come back to Marines United and then, and then wrap it up from there since this is something that, that, that has been in the news recently. Um, when the Marines United issue broke, and so again the, the issue of some male Marines posting uh, pictures of women Marines, nude and partially nude pictures on Facebook and other websites, U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis issued a statement, he called for an investigation into it, he issued a statement in which he said this, this is a quote from his statement, um, the Marines United issue demonstrated a lack of respect for Marines, and he said, quote, lack of respect for the dignity and humanity of fellow members of the Defense Department is unacceptable and counter to unit cohesion. I thought it was really interesting that he used those words because, again, one of the, um, that, that's something that opponents of women in combat talk about. They say, if we allow combat units to be integrated, that's going to harm unit cohesion. And Mattis is saying that what the, the, the male Marines did in Marines United, that is actually what's harming unit cohesion. He went on, Mattis went on to say in his statement, we will not excuse or tolerate such behavior if we are to uphold our values and maintain our ability to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. I also thought that was interesting, because again, one of the um, uh, um, uh, statements that's used by opponents of, of integrating women into combat is that will make it more difficult to um, carry out our mission. And, and Mattis is saying, actually, it's this, this type of sexual disrespect of our fellow Marines that is harmful to our ability to carry out our mission. So I thought his word choice was really interesting, given that that's, those are the same kind of words that opponents of the integration of women into combat units have used. Um, and so, again, we, what we've seen in terms of the integration of women into the military are these gradual steps, this type of pragmatic progressivism that the military has shown, at least since World War II. But also we see these, um, this, this much more entrenched cultural attitude about who actually is in our mind when we think of an American soldier. And I think when we think of an American soldier, we think of a combat uh, um, a combat soldier. And where does this image originate? Is, it, is this an example of the military shaping society or society shaping the military? So this is something that I think we can continue to ponder um, as more women join the military 
and the branches of the military move forward with the integration of women into combat. Thank you.
I don't know who we, how, how many of you ever seen it. It's Ray Charles singing America. America. Ray Charles sings it like no one in the world. And they show a, a guy running down the street in New York City carrying a 10-year-old child that's gotten some of the scrap milk from the building. And he's bleeding. This guy's running down the street. Ray Charles singing America. And this kid's running down the street. And the guy's looking at that. And when they're done, I said, guys, they attack New York City. Let's go get it. And everybody started screaming. Let's go get it. You know, you don't need no motivation. They attack New York. What do we need to be motivated for? With airborne ranger soldiers. Let's go get it. That's what being an American soldier is all about. When you're in special operations, and I'm calling it an airstrike, I'm calling artillery, I don't give a damn if the guy's purple. I don't care if he's purple. I don't care if he's a one-eyed flying purple people here. I want him to do his job. I want him to do it right. And whenever I call in that co-audience, I want to put exactly what I told him to put. That's what being a soldier is all about. All this black, white crap that's got no place there. That's what being an American fighting man is all about. And I realize that we all feel sometimes down track the fact that we're black or we're Jewish or we're gay or we're straight or whatever the hell we might be. Who cares? What we are is Americans. I've been to 24 foreign countries. This is the country you can be any damn thing you want to be. If you get off your ass and go do it. I'm a living example. Every day I shave, I see the American dream. So that's what it's all about. It's about opportunity to do what you need to do, to be what you want to be, and to do it. And I don't give a damn if you're a 50 Klansman out there. I'm the kind of guy you want to try to grab the a G. I'm the kind of guy you want to tie I guarantee you won't ever forget. What it's all about, what it's all about, uh, we live, sometimes people get this vision. We live in the greatest country in the world. And we're fortunate. I spent three years in Africa. Three years in Africa. I said, thank God I, my parents came on the slave ships and I didn't end up here. Thank God. You want to see racism? Go to Africa. Go to Nigeria. 41 different tribes. They all hate each other. Everybody hates everybody. Everybody speaks a different language. He's a Hindu, he's Mabutu, he's this, he's that, he's that. They're all black people. I wonder where we get this self-hatred of each other. When I went to Africa, I understood it. I understood it. Everybody hates everybody. He's in this tribe, he's in that tribe, he's in that tribe. He speaks this, he does this, his language is this. I said, you guys are crazy. At least in America, we all speak English. We all have an opportunity to be successful. We all have an opportunity to do something. In Africa, if you're born and your family's not rich, you would never go to school. You would never do anything except be in poverty. And I realize this about American soldiers and what American soldiers can and can't do. I'm one of 12 kids. I'm working on my master's. My parents didn't have money to send me to school. They didn't have money. That was all they could do to feed 12 kids. I came to the Army for opportunity. And every time I see my black soldiers in the Army spending their time uh, marching for racism or marching for this and that, instead of being in education, getting their grades, getting that opportunity, get that education, and to do something with their lives, I ain't got time for it. So I was maligned and vilified in the army. Because I ain't going to your markets. I ain't sitting up in front of the barrack doing no bad, clapping hands. I'm here to get what I need to be successful out here in life. And I'm not going to get it sitting around with a bunch of guys talking about what we're going to do when we get back in the world. Back in the world. You better think of what you're going to do with your life. And that's what the military gave me, this opportunity. They didn't give a damn if I was black. When I flew that helicopter or I called in corners, nobody cared who was black. 
They cared that you were there to save their ass. And that's when I'm sitting behind an M60 machine gun, an M50 machine gun, you think they care if I'm black? That anybody cares? They should care that I'm an expert at it, and everything I shoot at, I'm going to hit. When I came in the military, and they said, how in the hell did you learn to shoot like that? How did you, what, what? Because initially, you shoot this way. I told my drill sergeant, I said, Sergeant Castle, I always remember his name, Sergeant Castle, let me shoot the way I want to shoot. He says, Dr. what are you talking about? I said, this is not the way I learned to shoot. He said, how do you shoot? I shoot like this. He says, what? He said, it's backwards. I said, I don't know why. My kid does the same thing, and I didn't teach him that. When he started to be, yeah, he did it that way. And he said, listen, doctor, you haven't shot well. This is the last day. Shoot any damn way you want to shoot. <laughs> Just hit the top. I said, okay. Uh, I hit 99 out of 100 times. Because I had a situation with a gift that God had gave me that this eye is more powerful than this eye. And if I look at this eye, I always line it up and hit. If I fire from this side, if I can see it, I can hit it. All I do is see it, no matter what it is, if I can see it, I'm going to put a bullet right in the center of it. I say that, and I end this by saying, I'm proud to be an American soldier. I'm proud to be one of the best of the best. And I think that the one thing that sort of spawned me in the Army is when you're in special forces or special operations or any specialized unit, you have a spirit of core. You think you are the best, and you are what you think you are. And I stepped off that helicopter, I put on that uniform, and I thought I was an absolute catch me out. I'm not a soldier, I'm an SF Ranger. And I ain't bringing nothing but death and destruction. If you hate this country, if you want to hurt my Americans, if you want to hurt my family, and all my Americans are my family, you got to deal with me. And that's the way I believe it. And I believed it, and I have two artificial knees because of it. But that's what I believe. That all of you are my family, a family of Americans. And when the goings get tough, all Americans stick together. Until Americans 
learn to live together. We're going to die together as fools. Change the subject. This is the color of USO. I got a prize for the first one to tell me what the white USO is in Hattiesburg. Y'all know where the color USO is? Where's the white? How about Jackie Doe Shell Building downtown Hattiesburg? That's the white USO. You know the first thing I noticed? What was the constitutional law? Separate but equal? Give me a break. This building is a white wood building. Jacket Door Shell is a red two-story brick building. Interesting thing happened, and I assume we're going to get into that, as to racial discrimination that you may have encountered. When I left here in 58 and crossed the state line, I promised myself I would not return to Mississippi. That's the first lie I've been called in. <laughs> the second one, May 20,000, our company with Dr. Weiss, students of Vietnam. And I said I would never return there. So well, that's the second lie. <laughs> But we had some interesting students. And one of the things that I asked the guy, and they kept pointing out what the, now that the country was unified, uh, what all the North did, and what they're doing here, and, and everything. So I asked the guy, uh, where the South Vietnamese do the, where are they? And you know what he said to the group? No more South. South lost. Amen. We're American and we ain't got that yet. <laughs> South lost. Now I'm still seeing Confederate play. Now if I'm not mistaken, there's a law say it is not to be displayed. Did somebody correct me. South laws, friends, and we know why it had to pass. My skin color caused me discrimination by your skin color. Not you as individual, but you as a race.
Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Y'all getting quiet on me. <laughs> Y'all getting quiet on me. But this is the result of what we are in this country. And believe me, when I was in Vietnam, and we had a little incident, but one thing I made sure as an infantry platoon sergeant going to charge a hill at any given moment, that there's two colors in Vietnam, and it should be here. Well, in Vietnam, it was our green uniform and our red blood. No other color matters. In combat. But yet, when we was free to go socialize in this small village, we all went to our little respective places. For example, the white fellas went to Hillbilly Hill. Went to that bar. Me and my buddies, we went to the lovely bar. And we separated ourselves like that. Don't associate. One of the most hurtful things I saw in Vietnam was this graffiti. Our brother and my sisters are married a gook and a nigger. And a gook is the worst name you can call the South Vietnamese a Vietnamese person. But some white guy had to put that out there. They won't tell that to your face, but then again they will write it a bit. Another one of my incidents, the experience I'll tell you will bring a little closer to home. I was sitting there full time in Kentucky when Jane Barrett tried to integrate Ole Miss or tried to enroll Ole Miss. And the governor called out the Mississippi National Guard. And President Kennedy federalized them and had them to escort Mary Dean. Ford Cameron was sent to Oxford, Mississippi as riot control of different additional forces <coughs> should anything come out. But my unit was, we passed through Oxford with helmet on, chin strap in place, sit erect on the back of a deuce in the truck with bayonet fixed. The sure force. And when we get on the outside of Oxford, in those days, every man had three poles, six pen, and a half a tent. And two men had a tent together. When we got to this place, the bivouac, the word came down to put blacks with blacks and white with white. Because if they have to go in, they weren't going to send in blacks not to agitate the citizens. <coughs> they didn't use us that particular day. In fact, they didn't use it at all. The Mississippi National Guard, which were federalized, remained on the job. But we went to the naval station outside Memphis for three weeks. And all we did that three weeks was supposed to have been doing a uh, ride control. <laughs> when we got to Memphis, the black soldiers did this because they've been told they wasn't going in.
questions from the audience. We're also going to be selling and signing books afterwards. I want to say a statement. You see that we both are African American, but we had different experiences in the military. My experience was with a small unit, I want you to understand. My special forces unit consisted of 12 men. A military company can consist of over 200 men. 12 men. There are 12 of us. We didn't have time on no racial BS. We had to depend on each other to live. We were highly trained, highly respected, and we depended on each other. If you had a problem, but calling somebody anything other than what their rank was, you were gone. That was not tolerated. It was not even put up with. When you went through 52 weeks of training, they called you every single thing in the world with a child of God. If you lost your temper one time, you were history. We didn't have time for that crap. We didn't have time for coming up with a special handshake or patting each other on the butt. We weren't doing none of that crap. And if anybody was supposed to do something, they don't hide, hide their history, or somebody beat the hell out of them. But we didn't have time for that. We, there are all kinds of people in the military, doctors, lawyers, dentists, mechanics, we are killers. That's what we do, that's what we did, we're good at it, and we work together efficiently and effectively, and for us, all this other stuff, I didn't give a damn to the guy next to me black or white or Indian or Mexican, I knew he was an SS soldier. And that overshadowed any racial color. I want to emphasize that to you all. Yeah. Dr. Stern, do you think even with the opening of the combat roles that women have the same opportunities in the armed forces as men? Well, I mean, I guess technically we could say that in a technical way they will um, but I think when we take into consideration things like childbearing um, and the, the, the reality that issues of childcare and domestic, you know, domestic, using that word loosely, not just meaning in the home, but taking care of those kinds of home-related issues, um, I, I think in the military and in, in the civilian world too, that even when they're when, when legal barriers are removed from women's opportunity for advancement, other expectations and realities can still prevent them from having the same opportunities as men. But that's a great question. I saw a news real thing recently of a military people somewhere or other. There was this military officer woman in a maternity spot. They have a uniform. No, that is uniform, yeah. a uniform maternity dress. That's yeah. 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 That's there was a change. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions I always want to ask, I always want to ask, in special operations, you might get out in the middle of nowhere. You might, I mean, they give us all our equipment, or then they tell us, listen, you guys got to live on the land. Because if they're talking about we're going to carry all this food, I said, I'd rather carry ammunition. And there's some out there, that's what they call special forces soldiers, snake eaters. If you got a choice between carrying a, a bag of Wheaties and carrying ammunition, I think the choice is very simple. I'm going to carry the ammo, and if there's a squirrel out there, I'm going to kill them and eat them. You know, so I wonder how how women going to, because you still have to carry a 150-pound dummy, and you still got to run a half a mile, and nobody cares if it's the time of month or anything like that. And, and the last thing that I want to be is a, a soldier, woman, a male, met woman, or male. Come listen. I have cramps. I can't. I can't run today. I know you guys in the firefight, but I. You know, what's the deal? I'm. I'm serious. I don't want to hear that. I'm here for real. You know, I'm having menstrual cramps. Oh, I got. I got to go and lay down. What do you mean? We can get. Yeah. I, I mean those. All of those concerns are raised for sure. And I think, so opening of the ranger school or combat specialties to women doesn't mean that many women are going to get into those positions. So if th those who passed the ranger test, or they got... Which is tough. They did it by the same standards, my understanding, that the standards won't change either. So it will be a particular woman who wants that position 
different kind of woman. Who maybe tough. can, it, it, yeah, <laughs> the tough is a word I think that we would use for a woman who's in the well, room. That, right? I mean, that, and when you consider just like being, and I can understand it, because I remember my first day at, in, in SF training, my drill instructor came to me and my fellow African American, and he was African American. And he said, hey, I'm going to be tougher on you than anybody. I'm going to be tougher on you than anybody. Because the fact of the matter is, they're going to expect me to be lighter on you than you. So I'm going to be tougher, I'm going to be harder, I'm going to be everything. I just want to know if you're going to cut it. He said, no matter what they say to you, if they tell you you want to quit, I want you to say, the only way I quit is speak first. Speak first. Because the one thing that being an African American, just like if I was a woman, I'm not, but I don't want anybody to give me no preferential treatment. Because that's going to carry you forever. Oh, you just want a green bread because you're a, a, a woman. Or you just wearing a, a green beanie because it had to have a 10% of you had to be black. I don't want that. And I would like to think that no woman or a gay or a transsexual or whatever would want that themselves. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's absolutely right. And again, I don't think that we're going to see suddenly a lot of women in those most elite positions, but the, the opportunity is there for a tough person to, to pass those tests. <laughs> we, we had 115 guys and we had 42 graduates. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, I was in your army 64 to 67. Yes, okay, let me address God bless the, you. the discrimination part. <clears throat> I experienced that. Of course. Okay, because of my speaking voice, someone who was from New York and her speaking voice, they mixed up where we came from. Yes, ma'am. So they expected the other person was from the South and I was from the North, right? So. When we finally straightened several people out, <laughs> they decided that I was going to be the softer person to pick on. Okay. Because you're from New York? No, before, because I was from Hattiesburg. Oh, I see. Okay. They didn't know that I had marched for civil rights, all this kind of stuff. Yes, ma'am. So they found out I was just as tough as that black girl from New York, but that black girl from New York is <coughs> streetwise. And that ain't gonna help you in the military. Right, it, in certain sentences. Yes, ma'am. Dealing with some of the, the whites. That was trying to cause us Intimidate problems. you. Right, but they found out just because I was from the South. You were tougher than they thought. I was tougher than they thought. And uh, so I, I kind of made it on that, that my color, you, you don't need to look at my color. You need to look at this uniform. That's right. And, and you're my doing position your job. there at times, promotion and things. Yes, ma'am. You better look at this uniform. Because this uniform is going to top this, this color. And the unit I was assigned to this one, you know, some, I think some people felt like you're in a black company, but you weren't assigned to the black company. You were assigned to a unit. And the unit is the one that dictated what you were going to get. So when they finally realized that my unit stuck up for me, I didn't have as many problems as some of the units that maybe someone else was in that kind of went along with the status quo. I was in Maryland, outside of Baltimore, so you all know. Fort we Meade. think of it, Fort me. You think, you think that's a northern state, but huh. the, it's a southern. It might be a northern state, but it's southern altitude. So, you know, you had to sort of decide what you were going to do when you're black. What you're going to complain about. 
what you're going to stick up for. Since I was with the civil rights march here and everything, I was for. I'm an American. I don't care what my skin looked like. I still, I'm an American. I want to be treated as an American. What are the things that I emphasize to you when I talk to you on the phone? As a member of not necessarily elite unit, but black soldiers, most of them didn't like me at all. Because I, I went down with them. You know, I went down dapping, I went down walking around when you're going in and putting your fist in instead of saluting. I, I went down. I went down. I, I think when you talk about being tough, of my distinguished panelists, it's not about physical toughness. It's not about that. Because I realized when I walked in the door of the Ranger School, I walked in the door of basic training, they can't kill you. I mean, they can't. I mean, somebody's going to raise hell if they kill your ass, right? Somebody, my mama going to be down there going crazy, right? My mama going to be like, you killed my baby, you know? So I realized they can't kill you. can do is make you quit. So it's not if you're male or female or gay or straight or transsexual. It's your mental toughness that determines you from the other person. Mm -hmm. Because everyone can do push-ups. You can do push-ups to help result. You can work out and do all that stuff. But what the strongest muscle in any combat situation it's between right. your ears. The person that can think it out and can understand what's going on, they're going to win every time. Mm -hmm. So having brawn, never going to be a guy with a brain. Because he's going to figure out how to take you down. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I apologize that we ran like we had some interviews with the TV, but I know Dr. Weist has been waiting to ask questions. Why don't we ask that yeah, and then we'll I, wrap this I, up. I'm sorry. I asked a question specifically to Charles, man. We've, we've chatted a lot, and, you know, I, I know that you're a platoon, you know, you're a much bigger uh, 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 unit than Eddie was, platoon, That's true. Uh, 40 guys-ish, 67, so a lot of these platoon people that you're leading are got to be white, and a lot of them are probably not used to a black person being in charge of anything, much less being in charge of their lives. Did, how did your white soldiers take you being in charge of them? Was there any... They rallied around me for leadership. Got to trust me. That's what they did. Of course, I was a senior man and older, and they fell sick. We didn't have any problem. Uh, it, it was understood, as I said, what colors are concerned here. Green and red. Now, uh, as you mentioned that, I ran into some situation that I could have been fragged. I didn't know what fragged is. Ooh, we. You know what fragged is? You know what fragged is. <laughs> oh, that's tough. Now, that was a certain way you had to have to deal with video. Uh, most of the activity that was on in Vietnam were called search and destroy. You were given a certain area over a certain time to search it. Anything you found that A, a comfort the enemy, you destroyed it. Period. No question about what it is. If it A, a comfort the enemy, you destroyed it. Now, uh, as this uh, happened, in a fight fight and I'm on somebody's tail and we came back in around the fire support base and I had to uh, <coughs> see what they were doing and went into this if how many see the picture platoon? I you remember when they when they when they went back to the rear area and these in uh built uh, bunkers all decorated and everything. That's true. That's very true. I went through there one day and one of them said, Come here, Sarge. And I went in and said, Have a smoke, Sarge. Have a drink, Sarge. And I uh, looked at what's going on, fellas. Oh, Sarge. So I went on out and got a whole 
to my squad leaders and kick their butts. They was in charge of the four men. I was in charge of the four squad leaders. They were sitting there smoking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, now, uh, Fragging, had I been mean, uh, uh, bad, blank, blank, then in a fight fight, they could easily frag me. Let's be realistic, y'all. See, 